but it's a pleasure to introduce Monica Vazirani from UC Davis, who will tell us about the Springer representation of the Daha. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back for your morning, afternoon, evening, etc. Um, thanks very much to the organizers for doing a great job of, you know, putting this together and shifting from um, what was already a kind of forward-thinking format to having to do it all on Zoom. Um, this is my very first Zoom talk. I've been in tons of Zoom meetings, but I've never given a lecture yet. So um, I've had the experience of having chalkboard brain. I think I might get Zoom brain. So let's see. So uh, let's see. Everything I'm talking about um, today is joint with um, David Jordan and Sam Gunningham. And sorry for the misspelling. If that's the only mistake on my slides, we'll all be really lucky. And so um, let me just uh, jump into it, actually. So, all right, so what's the goal of my talk? Um, so D modules, we've had some talks already on D modules, and we can have a quantum deformation of D modules. And so, you know, what is that? What is, what is DQG? And what is the category of not just DQG modules, but strongly equivariant DQG modules? So I'm going to get to that eventually, but not in super detail, because getting a real definition in a talk you've never seen before um, is tough to grasp. And I'm only working in type A. So G is GLN or SLN. Um, for most of the um, things on the geometric side, uh, we might want to be talking about SLN, but then later on, there was the word DAHA, double affine HECA algebra, in the title. We're going to pull things through to the DAHA, and just things, common twerks work easier there for GL. So most of the time when I talk about results there, just for ease of exposition, most of those statements are going to be about GL instead of SL. Okay, so my goal is to um, tell you a little bit about this category, why you should care about it, what we found out about it, a little bit about what it looks like, um, and uh, the way that we find out what it looks like is actually by hitting it with a functor that takes you from D modules or quantum D modules to actually modules for the double affine HECA algebra, again, of type A, GL or SL, and at some specialized parameters, not roots of unity. Okay, and by knowing more about the DAHA, that's how we're learning more about this other category. And in particular, I'm going to define some quantum analogs of Hatakashiwara. Um, quantum D modules uh, and talk about that definition and what they go to under the functor. So my goal is to get through all of that. Um, and also part of my goal is to make it um, interesting to you as, um, well, this is geometric representation theory conference. And I, um, well, this is coming up on a slide. I'm not a geometer, so um, I have to work extra hard. Uh, so I'm kind of trying to highlight words and phrases and contexts that are meaningful to you all geometrically. Of course, then I put everything through this functor and come out on the Daha side, and that's where I can live. All right, so my rough outline is um, some of the background motivation, why I care about these questions. Um, starting from the classical side, before we get to the quantum side, always good to start there. Um, describing what these particular D modules are. And then um, I'm even, I'm going to talk about the D modules themselves before I actually talk about what, um, what DQG is, what, what, what strongly equivalent DQ modules are. I'm going to give you the examples first, um, at least if I stuck to my outline in the slides. And then, then describe what this functor is that takes me from D module land to double affine heck algebra land. Um, and then once I have all those ingredients, can start sticking things in the functor and saying what we get, and in that way start understanding this category that we want to understand. Okay, so, and um, I am totally not monitoring the chats and the questions, and I'm trusting the organizers to help me out with that. Okay, so my disclaimers, I think I already covered this. Everything I'm doing is type A. Um, that's almost the only place I know how to do things. My Q is generic. Um, the representation theory goes easier there, and I haven't thought about Q root of unity in this context, really. And um, 
as I mentioned, I'm more of a combinatorial representation theorist. So do ask questions if you have them, but if they're really geometric in nature, I might have to defer to some experts in the audience, which I'm happy to do. All right, so I told you the goals of my talk, and then of course, right, the overarching mathematical goals of this project is again to understand this category of strongly equivariant um, quantum D modules and how by using um, David Jordan's functor, which is modeled on a, in the degenerate case for the rational Trebnik algebra, a functor by Kalak and Mikas Eddinghoff, the attributions occur on a different slide, um, that takes you from this category of modules to representations for the double affine Hecke algebra, which um, I will only sketchily define what that algebra is um, on later slides and give you some sense of it. Okay. Uh, all right, I'll say more about that later. Um, so some of the larger context that this fits in, now I could bring up some words like things like um, character sheaves and I threw around the word Springer in the title, but um, that's you know more for your benefit. For me, I'm really happy just to understand things that are Daha representation, but the ideas around this, um, there's also connections with factorization homology of the torus um, with coefficients in the braided tensor category of integrable UQG modules, again, G, SL, or GL. Um, and factors, this factorization homology has been shown by, um, I think it's Jordan, is it with Bensby and Verchier, that um, it's equ equivalent to this category of the strongly equivariant quantum D modules. So that's a really interesting side to work on. Um, and that gives us connections to um, four-dimensional topological field theories, okay, or even TQFTs that are behind this, the scenes. And so that's making connections between double affine Hecke algebras and three manifold invariants, which are important. And um, also there's connections to um, scheme theory, some of the work with, um, that Sam and David did also with um, Pavel Safranov. Uh, make connections between these ideas um, and some really interesting results in, uh, having to do with scan modules. I'm not going to talk about those, but that's just to pique your interest. Um, so here's where I tried to list um, various people whose ideas and work all of these ideas build on top of, and I'm sure I left some people out. Um, um, so definitely of, no, where are they? So. Um, a lot of these ideas are inspired by uh, work of Kalak and Rikas Eddinghoff um, for, to build these functors, to build what are these quantum deformations of classical objects. Um, various people here whose um, names I'm not going to say all out loud if that's okay. And um, please speak up if um, I need to credit you because I'm really terrible and sloppy about that. All right. Okay. So, Moving through my outline, let's get the classical picture uh, set up a little bit before we go to say, well, what's the quantum picture and what are the results? Okay, so Springer, what do you use Springer theory for? Well, one thing is you can get the irreducible representation of the symmetric group because I'm only talking type A. Of course, you know, there's other types and things happen. Um, but, you know, I, uh, instead of working with, um, you know, cohomology, perverse sheaves, and so on, you can pull things through the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence instead of work with D modules. And so that's the land I'm going to work in. Um, and that's fair enough for geometric representation theory. Okay. Um, so, all right. So we were originally calling it the Springer sheaf because it does connect up to the idea of working on the, on the nilpotent cone and getting, you know, getting Springer theory from it. But we decided to kind of rename it partway through, um, instead of a Springer sheaf, a Hadakashiwara uh, D module. We're talking about what we're cute forming. So what is that? Okay, so hopefully D modules you're okay with, right? You just have you know functions on your Lie algebra and differential operators that you get, and they interact, and there you go, and you can talk about modules for it. And uh, I want to take a module that's a, a quotient of that by the following. Well, I want it to be G equivariant. And so that's by killing this and this ideal that gives me my um, G equivariance if I want it. And then I also, you know, this HK sub zero, what makes it Springer-like, what attaches it to the nilpotent cone, 
this this J zero is basically cutting out and saying that well, you know, how do you say a matrix is nilpotent? You can say, well, all of its eigenvalues are zero, or you can say, look, when I look at all my invariants, my um, my characteristic polynomial, my elementary symmetric functions, and the eigenvalues, my um, invariant polynomial functions on the group, those invariants, what do you get? You always get zero. Okay, and so that's what that J zero is. And so this is my first D module that I'm talking about. And, you know, as expected, that the endomorphisms of that D module give me the symmetric group. And so I'm basically seeing the regular representation of the symmetric group here. And so, again, that's kind of uh, the D module side of this story. Can you get all the irreducibles individually looking at the different nilpotent orbits? Yes, you can. I'm not going to go there today. Um, All right, and so, well, you could say, okay, right. You don't just have to say that all of your eigenvalues are zeros, right? You can say, hey, give me any characteristic polynomial. Give me, um, right, any set of invariants that's, that's possible. That's what this chi is going to represent. And so you can um, generalize um, this D module to a whole family. Instead of HK zero, we have HK chi, right? And you might ask, well, what are the endomorphisms of that D module, well, instead of getting all of the symmetric group, you're going to get some parabolic subgroup that pretty that corresponds to the stabilizer. I think you know zero 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 zero. What stabilizes that? All of the symmetric group. They have like three zeros and two fives. You know, you have something like S three cross S two. Okay, and you could say, all right, so we get to vary this chi and say, you know, do whatever you want for your characters of polynomial, and you could say, well, what if we get rid of that? What if we don't want to nail down this characteristic polynomial? Does that make sense? Then what do we get? Sure, we can um, make that D module, keep the equivariance, throw away um, specifying the, what the invariants do on it. And you could think of that as kind of a universal Hadakashiwara module, but we're also calling it dist for distinguished, the distinguished object. I think that's what dist is for anyway. Um, and you say, okay, well, what, what do you get there? What are the endomorphisms of that? And that, um, by work that, that Sam can do a much better job of explaining than I can, um, it's going to look like, instead, uh, SN invariance of differential operators just on your torus. They just, we're GLN, just say diagonal matrices there. Okay? So, um, and if you know about rational trinic algebras, dahas, actually, we've seen spherical RCA come up um, in several of the talks already. Um, at this conference, it looks like a spherical RCA, but at parameter zero, because um, you've gotten rid of a lot of these lower order terms. Okay, so, boom. All right, so that's the classical story. And now I want to move from classical to quantum and all of this and convince you that we're doing this in a sensible way. So how do you naively go from classical to quantum well, you know, if we're starting out with this Springer, this, you know, nil potent specifying your eigenvalues being zero, you go, you know, think, go from algebra to group, group to quantum group, right? So nil potent to unipotent to David calls it unipotent. And I like to not put the U in there. He likes to put the U in there. So I put the U in there. But ah, yes. And if you, sorry, if you go to unipotent, um, the, instead of seeing one, 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 in our situation, we're going to see like one, Q to the minus two, Q to the minus four, Q to the minus six, and so on. And of course, we could renormalize um, all of this um, if you want to think of them as positive powers and then shift what's happening with your um, invariance a bit. Oops, there we go. Um, right, so, and again, that's going, so D modules on the algebra, D modules on the group, and then whatever we mean by quantum D modules here. Okay, and again, to specify that you have something nilpotent, I was talking about, you know, these invariants are basically, I think of them as elementary symmetric functions and eigenvalues, uh, but, you know, we want to be thinking of them as um, those invariants as sort of Casimir's, higher Casimir, so trace is more like Casimir, but then you have all the other coefficients. That is cutting this out. So, 
oh yeah, I meant to do something. I'll do it later on my computer. Okay, all right, so now let's talk about what the quantum version of these D modules looks like, even before I tell you what I mean by DQG. So, well, whatever, so you have D of G from the classical differential operators on the Lie algebra, and let's say someone's already figured out, which they have, what's, what is a good definition of quantum D modules. So then in the same way that we made HK0 before, yeah, we're gonna mod out by a left ideal, I forgot to mention left ideal, non-commutative world. And that left ideal has two parts. So um, this part is just like saying you have the G invariance. That was like that, that, this add G action, asking, asking that the G action um, that you have sort of you know, from adjoint versus from you know, vector fields, differential operators, that those two actions agree. And so that's what the moment map is controlling. And so this is just notation for the quantum analog of that piece of the ideal we're modding out by. Okay, and then similarly, we have this, this J0, and we have to um, specify, well, really, right, you've got differential operators, you've got, you know, you know sort of for, for D of G, you've got like, you know, DDXs and you've got Xs, you know, you've got functions and differential operators, and you want to specify where are you saying that those invariants, that characteristic polynomials, you know, like unipotent, unipotent, um, you have to pick one side or the other. And so that's just this little doohickey symbol there is just telling us um, which side we're smashing down. Fourier transform would pick the other one. Okay, and so then that is um, this definition of how you make the quantum version of this Hatakashiwara module. And just like before, you could say, look, I don't just have to think about support on the cunipotent part as opposed to you know nilpotent. I can put um, any collection of invariants there. So you should think of it as any characteristic polynomial, basically. Okay. And then, um, so, so part of this is, I would say, is the definition. And then, okay, so what's the result? And I'd say result in progress, because we're still writing things up and sorting things out. And there's a lot of layers to the proof. But you can ask, what are the endomorphisms of this quantum version? And again, you get the, the group algebra, the symmetric group. Okay, so again, you're seeing something like that looks like the regular representation there. Um, and the same thing if you put in this um, variant of it um, by specifying chi, a different character polynomial, you again get um, the group algebra of a parabolic subgroup. But th the way you specify chi and the way you say what the action is in the stabilizer is, um, it's a little bit different, right? Because getting the full symmetric group it used to correspond to zero, 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 zero. Now it's corresponding to something like one Q to the minus two, Q to the minus four, and so on. So that stabilizer has to do with ratios being Q squared or not. And again, we can say, well, let's get rid of, um, you know, nailing how I want my Casimirs to act. Let's just make something more universal. Let's make a dist here. Let's only mod out by what you need to make things strongly equivariant. And this is this more, you know, universal module and you can say okay well what does that look like and what are its endomorphisms and there we get well for for whatever reasons it's anti-spherical not spherical meaning you're smashing it between the cyanide impotent not the trivial item potent and the anti-spherical daha at um, the correct parameters that uh, enter into this theory okay so let's see where i am on slides no oh, okay i think few more slides before a break, if that's okay. And I think, yeah, we started a minute late too. Um, all right, so now, the, okay, so that's the setup. Let me go back a second, right? Sort of that's the setup and that's the theorem. And now let me fill in the, okay, what is this DQG and how do we get to the theorem? Okay, so, um, just to give you um, the, the way to think about it, right? You, have to, you know, let's start with sort of a vial algebra. You, know, you start with, okay, you know, you've got, you know, C of X, and then you have, you know, C of X, and you put in DDX. And, you know, we know and love that algebra, and we sort of think of, you know, um, 
that the X's are acting freely and the DDX's are sort of annihilating lowering degree. Um, and so, you know, how do you make differential operator? How do you make D of G for G a, a Lie algebra? Well, again, you know, you have functions on it and then you throw in your differential operators. Um, if it's differential operators, if it's D of G for G, the group, similar story. Um, and so if you want to talk about quantum D modules, the first thing you need to do is understand what do you mean by um, the quantum coordinate algebra. Okay. And so you do that, I'll, more details on slides to come, and you sort of built up from two copies of that in some way with some interesting relations that models this picture. And for those of you that know the rational Trednik algebra, the double affine Hecke algebra, you know that those have these polynomials sitting inside them. You know, you also have X's and Y's. And um, at least if you're living in something like a category O, the X's will be, you know, creating and the Y's will be basically differentiating. Um, and the same thing in the Daha, then we'll have the wrong polynomials and X's and Y's that don't commute with each other in the same way these two copies of X's and DDX's don't commute with each other. So they're, um, you know, we've built up in sort of similar ways, have similar ways of thinking of them. Oh, and later on, when I actually get into some of the nuts and bolts of what is DQG, built up from sort of two copies of OQG, there's sort of an A copy and a B copy. And that's just warning you of notation for later. Okay. So, um, Right, so to build up DQG, I have to describe OQG. What do I mean by a quantum coordinate algebra? How am I gonna quantize that? Of course, there's not a unique way to do it, um, but the way that we're doing it in this arena, I think is you know, good and useful and justifiable. And so um, you can think of it as the algebra of matrix coefficients. It's actually isomorphic to the locally finite subalgebra of UQG. Um, and um, in what, what way is it quantizing? It's quantizing the semenov tianchansky bracket, excuse me. Okay. And um, so I'm not going to go into huge detail on that. I think I have another slide with a little more information on it. And again, DQG is built up from two copies that don't commute with each other. Um, and we have kind of an A copy, a B copy, which I'm sort of saying is a right and a left. But there's also a third action that's kind of like this add action that comes into the mix. Um, all right. And oh yeah, so OQG, if you um, want uh, to get a feel for it, if you, if you didn't yet invert the determinant to make it for GLN, if you just put matrices there, that's the reflection equation algebra. If you want to get what the relations look like, for how not commutative OQG is. And then of course DQG is extra not commutative because it has those two copies. And um, um, yes, thanks Ron. Yes, I knew that. That's um, uh, Semenov uh, Tianchansky is one big last name. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So that was a little bit about what DQG looks like. So my quantum D modules are you know, modules for that algebra. That's how I like to think about them. And then what are the strongly equivariant ones? Well, they're the ones that are you know, killed by this ideal, the ones where you know, this kind of add G action and the, the G action that the moment map tells you should agree. And this is the right thing to kill to get that um, modulo, all the notation of what that is. Okay, and it does put these extra relations. I have this A copy and this B copy of my OQG, and this quotient also puts extra relations among them that you can make use of when you're actually doing computations. Um, David actually built some really nice magma code where we like get our hands dirty and deal with it. And I think, let me just check what's coming. Ah, okay. One more slide than intermission? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, all right. So I already said. So now, right. So now we have a vague idea of um, OQG of, of quantizing um, the coordinate algebra on G, and a vague idea of DQG quantum um, 
D, quantum D modules. Um, and then I already told you what this Hadakashiwara um, module should be, what you, what you quotient out by. You take kind of this dist and you put an extra relation that specify your invariance. And again, classically specifying your invariance kind of is about trace of A, A squared, A cubed, or instead of trace, you could think Casimir um, or coefficient of character polynomial. What we do have, um, these higher Casimirs in the DQG setting. And so again, Kai is specifying those. Um, if we want to talk about um, living in the land where, where Springer is, that instead of you know, nilpotent, cunipotent, that's um, basically um, Kai agreeing with um, our, our co-unit there. Um, and, um, ah, and then something else to say, that um, given um, that you've chosen this chi, there's a way to think of this Hadakashiwara quantum D module as sort of a universally category O type module. I should have put an O chi there, probably, um, uh, among the strongly equivariant ones. So, um, and again, so next up after the break, I'll start talking about this functor. Um, and once I do, it was, it's going to send this Hadakashiwara module into this category O. And again, I guess I could call it, I should have maybe called it Okai. Um, and this was part of motivating the definition for these D modules and why we want to look at them. That sort of understanding them and where they go under the functor is giving us, you know, as much information as our category as we sort of need and desire. So let's do a little break. Okay, great. Um, did anyone have any questions just in the five minutes to catch everyone up? Uh, yeah, why you restrict yourself to SLN only or GLN or whatever? Ah, so, so for me personally, it's being very type A, but one reason is um, the functor that goes to um, DAHA um, is defined in type A. Um, there's an analog by Jordan Ma that if you instead basically work with like symmetric space, like GLP plus Q mod GLP cross GLQ, you can work with that and get to something that's more like a type BC dot huh? um, And so that's that's the reason. And it would be great to work with that eventually, but um, you know we're starting with the easiest thing, which is type A, and just getting as much information as we can there. And also, I should say, I don't know how to access the quantum D modules in the other types. My, my only access to it is because there is this functor that leads me to DAHA and because I'm happy with DAHA. So again, just a naive question. So, um, uh, so about the statement that DAHA is endomorphism, so there's universal H key. H key uh, so mm -hmm. what does it become uh, when Q is equal to 1? Uh, for Q equals 1, that would be, I think it would end up being, you'd have to look at basically the, um, so saying Q equals one would mean we were doing D of the group G, not the algebra, right? And then it would basically be, you'd look at the trigonometric DAHA and look at something spherical there, but I'd have to um, check about what the parameter would be. Again, everybody's different presentation changes a little bit what you mean by your parameter and whether it would be, um, spherical or anti-spherical and there's a way to go back and forth between i think most naturally it would be anti-spherical and you would look so, at the trigonometric uh, okay can i just make a comment uh, please yeah I, I i'm not sure i quite agree if you if you sort of just naively set q to one then i think what you get is rather invariant functions on the commuting variety of g oh. and this distinguished this category of strongly equivalent modules just becomes the equivariant coherent sheaves on the on the commuting variety and then this is the endomorphisms of the structure sheaf in that category. But this uh, f uh, ring of invariant functions is then realized as endomorphisms of some D module and so is that something classical or clear? So, sorry, say that again? Well, he, so the main result was that this the uh, high is realized as endomorphisms of some Q D module if I understand correctly, when Q is one, then Q D module becomes just a D module. Yeah. So, so there's a uh, so uh, 
there's a sort of naive deformation of that algebra of invariant functions on the uh, so the, so the invariant functions of the commuting variety will, will be the w invariants on functions on t times t uh, uh, and you can sort of deform that in okay. a few different ways w vary by shift functors and so this is sort of applying a shift functor to the naive deformation which is like dqt w invariants Yeah, there we go. Ah. Oops, sir, can you see button. can you see uh Kalak and Rick sitting go at q is equal to one limit in some sense? Um so that also goes from G modules to modules of a rational. Right. So for that, let me just um go back to where I was. Um um, so well, passing from, I mean, you can kind of see it from the beginning in some, I mean, you can just, um, how do I want to say it? So, so in their paper, they do look, um, not at a Hadakashiwara module. I think they, they look at something close. They look at like a D module supported on the nilpotent cone and put that in and, and compute what, or they, they are able to get basically these, you know, L of lambda irreducibles by putting in um, sort of the correct E module that's supported on that nilpotent orbit. Um, but so your question is about doing putting in something like dist and seeing for CEE what happens. Yeah. So. Um, prob probably. You can just sort of do it directly in that setting and see what you get. Um, and you should get spherical RCA there. But I haven't actually tried to do it directly in that setting. Um, and I don't I don't I don't think it was in that paper. I don't think that they've done that. Um, and whether the techniques that we use to show it would work. There they probably would, right, Sam? Uh, yeah, I, I think they would. But but also there's a sort of another approach, uh, which is you can use the theorem of Levasseur and Stafford to ident. I mean that that identifies this end of dist with mm -hmm. again W invariant differential operators on T. So that's that's this sort of spherical RCA at parameter c equals zero, and then there's a shift to parameter c equals something minus one or something like that. Uh, Anti-spherical RCA for C equals minus one should be equivalent to spherical RCA for C equals zero. And so this passing through that is somehow natural to just pass directly to that anti-spherical RCA from this Cheval perspective. But, uh, you, you can sort of see it through this Levasseur Stafford theorem as well. So we've had about a five minute break. Um, I think if we're okay with questions, maybe we can just continue. Is that, is that okay, Monica? That is fine with me. And oops. cool. All right, I'm just making sure I didn't do anything funny with either computer during the break. I don't think so. Okay, so to recap where we were, I already convinced everyone that strongly equivariant, the category of strongly equivariant quantum D modules is really exciting and you want to learn about it and you're excited to know all of these theorems and you know terribly impressed. And so now that I've sparked your interest in that category, how do we learn about it? And what is our what are some of our tools? Well, for me, um, this tool, there's a functor that takes me from strongly equivariant quantum D modules to modules for the double affine Heck algebra. And again, in type A, GL with GL, SL with SL. And so um, what does this functor look like? So you also give me an integer D and I take V, the defining representation for say my GLN, and I take V tensor itself D times. Um, and then I tensor that with my D module. And then because it's you know, strongly equivariant, I have this nice action of UQG 
on that. Um, and I um, take invariance with respect to that UQG action. And by invariance, that's a better word if we're talking about SL. If it's GL, I shouldn't really say invariance. It's really finding the correct copy of sort of the determinant representation in there, um, the correct GLN analog to take. And then so, um, so this functor, if we, oops, right? So the, the degenerate version of it is, you know, the same thing. You take your defining representation, you tensor it with an ordinary D module, you take in, let's say, true invariance of your SLN, and then the RCA acts. And so um, Kalak and Enriquez Eddinghoff um, showed that, and then David Jordan upgraded it to, on the quantum version, getting the DAHA to act. And, um, and I have to um, mention here that you, you do have to take invariance for it to get a DAHA action for all of the relations to be satisfied among the generators. You can just kind of write down, have, you know, these generators act this way, have these generators act that way. Um, they'll only satisfy the appropriate relations on the invariance. And um, this is kind of a servile kind of functor, if you think about it, right? Whenever you see sort of this, you know, if we didn't have the M there, if we just said V tensor D, you know, commuting actions of say symmetric group and, and GLN, on it, SD and GLN. So, so that's, that's the functor. And um, great. Okay. And so, um, so right, so it takes a D module, it spits me out a DAHA module, and what is the DAHA? So um, I've got two parameters Q and T, and I am having them backwards from how many people have Q and T, just because um, we like to talk about UQG, and if you're having UQG, Q is your sort of quadratic parameter that you're expecting to have, then T is more your loop parameter that goes with the um, imaginary root that's flopped from that in, say, Cherednik and a lot of other places. Um, and so K, you know, K is my field big enough to have my Q and T in it, which are generic, except that um, for the output of the functor, for the functor to work, it sets a relation between Q and T, which um, for the GLN case, it's that your T is Q to the minus 2K. And what's K? K is such that D is KN. So D is how many strands I have, how many, you know, Y1 through YD, finite heck algebra. That's my D of my Shervile. How many Bs I have, that's D. And so basically, to get invariance at all out of this functor, D has to be a multiple of N, as in GLN. Okay, so that K is an integer. And that's this K um, that appears here in this relation. I guess I could have said, um, you know, n over d instead of k. All right. So what is my daha? So there's a finite Hecke algebra part, which if you don't like that, you can just think symmetric group SD. And then there's two Laurent polynomial pieces that don't interact nicely at all with each other, but they do interact well with they each copy of the finite Hecke algebra acts on each polynomial um, algebra well in, in such a way that you get an affine Hecke algebra for each of those. So not quite um, a semi-direct product. Um, so, and then I also will call um, y, um, curly Y for shorthand. These are all polynomials in the Ys. And to, just to give you, um, I borrowed this slide from a, a different talk, um, to give you a diagrammatic sense of how to think about these generators, this finite Hecke algebra part, x's and y's, I put in, um, I'm not going to put in, in the Hakashiwara module, I'm just going to put in a quotient of it. So it turns out that OQG, my um, quantum coordinate functions on G, is naturally a D module. And in fact, it's a quotient of my, um, my Springer, my, uh, my zero Hakashiwara D module. And that module is really nice because with respect to the UQG action, with respect to which I'm taking invariance for um, the definition of the functor, it has this peter Weyl decomposition as, um, you know, V lambda tensor V lambda dual is lambda ranging over your integral dominant weights. And so if you sort of um, break up M into all of those pieces, you can have this kind of diagrammatic picture of how each of the generators act. And for those of you who aren't comfortable with DAHA, this is maybe a way to get a feel of what DAHA looks like, which is the sort of the, you know, the symmetric group SD, finite heck algebra part on the VVVVV, the D copies, 
is basically just doing an R matrix, or, you know, R matrix with swap, the thing that you do to get your vial duality to work. Okay, which we just kind of can draw di diagrammatically as this crossing, which is over crossing, under cross positive crossing. I don't know that, is that a positive, oh, I don't know if I made it a positive crossing, it's my teak skills. Okay, um, Y1, and there's also a Y2, Y3, and so on. Um, it takes sort of the rightmost V and kind of wraps it around. So it's interacting with M somehow. I can only draw this picture given I have this Peter Vial decomposition. It gives you some kind of a sense of what's happening. In what's going to happen diagrammatic in the later slide, lambda is going to be zero. So it, I'm not going to really be drawing strands there, but I'll have a picture for my Ys. And my X is more complicated. Um, you know, it kind of, it moves over, you sort of building and creating Vs and V duals and cups and caps and so on, borrowing extra copies of Vs because I do get to sum over all of these lambdas. So understanding what um, the functor does to this OQG isn't sort of the goal of the talk, but, um, you know, we were, we, in previous work, we did study it and we figured out you get this, an irreducible representation for the Daha, the so-called rectangular representation, and we're able to study it in this way. And it was sort of, um, you know, the building block is to actually get, okay, let's put in some more interesting module than this. All right. So, all right, so, so what are the results that we have? Um, I mentioned them on a previous slide, but to get into more of the details of it. Um, so let me put in this Springer Hadakashiwara module, the one that's like the cunipotent, okay? Um, what module do you get when you put it into the functor? So first of all, I'm taking K equals one. In other words, my D is capital N of GLN. So V, 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 N times, and it's GLN. And um, why? Because it's, it's hard enough to start there and get the results. And we're going to upgrade in the future to, to higher K. But let's start with K as one. So what is that module? That module is an induced module. So you have the Ys, these Laurent polynomials, and you have a particular one-dimensional representation of it. Y1 acting as Q to the zero, Y2 acting as Q to the minus two, and so on. Okay, and that should also remind you of this cunipotence. Um, that particular one-dimensional module, you induce it from these Ys all the way up to the Daha, so infinite dimensional. Okay, and, and that's the output. And then, what does that look like as a Daha representation? It's semi-simple. It completely decomposes into irreducibles. And again, this is in progress because we have most of the proof sketched out, but not totally written down yet. And there's you know, various ingredients that go into this. But uh, it looks like the regular representation of the symmetric group in terms of how many irreducibles it, pieces it has and with what multiplicities, OK? Um, and it should be a little surprising. I mean, the Daha is very not semi-simple. It's kind of surprising. It should be surprising to you that actually this induced module would end up being semi-simple. For instance, if I were to induce just from Ys to the affine Hecke algebra, the same one dimensional, it would be indecomposable. OK? And with not as many. Um, subquotients either. So it's somehow, it's very interesting that when you go to the Daha, it completely decomposes in this way. And, and part of why that happens, I think, is because, well, this module didn't just come from anywhere. It came from a D module. It came from um, a nice category where things are semi-simple. Okay. So, and then, so proving that is, is you know, all about living in the Daha um, and enjoying that. So then, well, so given that we understand what's happening in the Daha, it's pretty easy to see that the endomorphism of this induced module as a Daha module, it's Daha endomorphisms, looks like the symmetric group. And I had a complex numbers here before I put K in there. K is my field that just has Q and T. I could have put C. Um, right, so this endomorphism algebra it looks like the symmetric group. And again, this was this kind of Springer theory um, takeaway that we sort of started with, right? How are you getting this regular representation of the symmetric group or these, these representations? This is my quantum analog of that. And then, but wrapped up in this theorem is saying, ah, but then that's also the DQ endomorphisms of my Springer Hadakashiwara module, okay? It is, um, looks like the group algebra, the symmetric group, so going from there to there is the theorem. And well, this is how, how we get there, right? So we have to analyze 
the functor and understand it and be able to say that, yeah, um, if I understand the daha endomorphisms of the output of the functor, I understand the DQ endomorphisms of the input of the functor. Um, and so that takes a lot of work too. And again, some of that is, is in progress um, in terms of the writing. So there's some good, honest work there. Okay. And then again, you can say, okay, what about other chi? Sure, so that you, you basically um, can look at other, other chi, meaning asking your Casimirs acting not in this unipotent one, it's modeled on the unipotent or nilpotent, have it act by you know, any set of invariants that you want. Um, you can then, again, you'll get a parabolic, the appropriate parabolic subgroup there. And again, I didn't say exactly what W chi looks like here in terms of stabilizing, it's a little bit different um, action. Um, from, say, in the nilpotent case. And then again, you can say, okay, well, let's put in this distinguished module and see what we get. So what does the functor give us? It gives us um, um, sort of H, I'm calling it epsilon. Um, I guess I could have used a little E. We've been using so many E's. So you basically take the um, sine idempotent for the finite Hecke algebra, right? And you take the left module that that generates. Okay, and that's what gets pushed out. So if you agree with that, then the, and the daha endomorphisms of um, a ring cut out by an idempotent is, of course, this corner ring, this EHE, which is my antispherical daha. So, um, right, if you believe that that's what, what um, the functor pushes out from disk, it's pretty easy to see that that's what the endomorphisms are. And then again, because we show and understand that the functor um, is a good functor, that means that the endomorphisms of the distinguished module as a quantum D module is also this antispherical daha. And so, and, and for GLN, dist really is generating this, this category of strongly equivariant modules. So that's saying that we have a really excellent understanding of the category of strongly equivariant D modules now in this, this quantum world. And all right, so I think since I, oh wait, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. Do I need to look at any of them? Uh, all right, I'll look at them after. Um, so since I think I still do have a little bit of time, right? Kevin, do I, or whoever's chairing, do I have like? Yes, yeah, another five minutes for sure. Another five minutes, okay. And maybe a couple of minutes late, so um, at, at least five minutes. Okay, cool. So, um, so since I do have those five minutes, let me talk a little bit about some of the ideas. That go into the proofs. I think for me, this is the most exciting part of the project, but I recognize for most listeners in a talk is probably the most boring because it's the most level of detail. Um, and I, um, I'm not going to promise to not make it excruciating in that detail because I love this stuff. All right. So, um, right. So I said for this, this Hadakashiwara module, so maybe I should. Um, on there. So this was when we put in this, this sort of Springer Hadakashua module, I said this is the induced module that we get. You have a one dimensional for the Y's and you induce it up. But how do we see that? Well, there's actually another way to see that induced module and you can actually even see it. You don't have to go all the way to the Daha. You can just go to the affine Hecke algebra. So the affine Hecke algebra has not just the y's as a nice subalgebra of it, it has this subalgebra that I'm calling um, H tensor sim. So H is just shorthand for my finite Hecke algebra, and sim are these um, symmetric Laurent polynomials. And so that's a per so the, the there's an affine Hecke algebra that contains the finite Hecke algebra and all of the y's. So just take the symmetric ones, and guess what? The symmetric ones commute with H finite. So that's a really lovely subalgebra. Yeah. And so that sits inside. And so I can take a one dimension, and, and that has the rank of the affine Hecke algebra over that is n factorial in the same way the rank of it over the y's is n factorial. Okay, so it's the same sort of size subalgebra. And that has a one dimensional representation where I say the finite Hecke algebra should act as sine, and the y should act, well, I don't have to specify each individual y. 
um, I just have to say like a Y orbit or symmetric polynomial, but I, you know, chi naught is the character such that up to reordering the Ys, they act as Q to zero, Q to the minus two, and so on. So that's my chi zero that goes with that. Okay. So that's a perfectly good one dimensional representation. If I induce that up from either subalgebra to the aha, either the sine tensor chi zero on this side or specifying all the Ys on that side, they're the same exact representation. And that's even true in the affine heck algebra. So of course it's true if you go all the way up to the double affine heck algebra. Okay. And so why do I bother to say that in the daha? Well, this right-hand side inducing from, from Ys, that's a really nice way to understand the representation and analyze it, decompose it, look at its endomorphs, and so on. This other way of thinking of the induced module, induced from this funny subalgebra, it's more natural to see that that's the output of the functor. Okay, And why should that be um, the output of the functor? Well, here's, I'm you know, going to mostly get, give you the proof there. So, so what did the functor do? The functor took this Hadakashiwara module, it tensored it with V a whole bunch of times, and then took invariance. And so hit that with the sine idempotent and see what you get. Well, you can just use plain old Shervile duality there, or just use you know, what you know about GLN. If you hit V tensor M with the sine idempotent, it becomes wedge N of V. It becomes one dimensional, becomes the determinant representation. Okay? And those are already invariants. And so I can just think about, the, I've moved my invariance over into my Hadakashiwara module, which again, was a quotient of DQ, um, whose you know, invariants include all of these Casimirs, right? And so this carries the sign representation for how the finite Heka algebra acts. Now I just have to convince you it carries this chi zero or this chi for how all the Ys are acting. And the chi from Hadakashiwara was specified by all of these Casimirs acting. And so I just need to show you those are the same. At least that will tell me that the output of the functor contains uh, an H tensor sim vector that looks like sine tensor chi naught. And once it contains it, I get a map from the induced module, then I can do some work to show actually, yes, it is this induced module. And so for that proof, we go back to, well, we have this diagrammatic way of thinking of the Ys. We have a diagrammatic way of thinking of the Casimirs also um, due to Resh Tekin. I stole this picture, even though I get to do it on a tablet, this picture was really nice in um, Jordan White of how to think about what these higher Casimirs are, which is it's this little loop-de-loop from the kth wedge of v dual to the kth, uh, the kth wedge of v dual to the kth wedge of v. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's diagrammatically. And then you basically do a little diagrammatic sketch. You say, okay, my y's did something like, well, let's say just take any, so let's say we take just y1, y2, y3. It, you know, diagrammatically looks roughly like this picture but then I'm hitting it with idempotents on either side, the sine idempotent. And once you get the sine idempotent, that means you get to wiggle things around as much as you want, and you have to pay a price of certain powers of negative Q inverse. Um, and you do that and you compare it to this picture here, which got a little bit smushed off the end, which is what the Casimir is basically doing. And given that you have the sandwich between these sine idempotents, you're just like, hey, up to a constant out front, they agree, but that's okay because I want to take the whole elementary symmetric function in the y's, not just y1, y2, y3. And because I have the sine idempotent there, whether I have y1, y2, y3, or something like y2, y7, y8, when I sandwich it between the sine idempotent, those just differ up to a constant. So same thing with the elementary symmetric function. And then you cap things off to compare the constants, and you're like, hey, these elementary symmetric functions in the y's versus the Casimir's sandwich between the sine idempotent, they agree. And so then that goes back and that tells you basically your argument of identifying, perhaps I should, whoops, have put my equals over here, ack, pen, pen. I should have actually put my equals over there, right? And then coming through there. So I think, ha ha, done. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, so, I think we had a couple of questions. Uh, let me just make sure uh, participants can unmute themselves. Um, 
I can see there's a bunch of questions and I, I appreciate, I think Sam was answering some of them, which is great. Uh, so let me see. Um, Tom, uh, did you want to ask? Yeah, Tom, go uh, for it. I, I think Sam answered my question, but thank you for, yeah. uh, thank you for, I guess, I guess my question was that if, if the, is there some object in your category of like O or DG strong for which like your Daha D is endomorphisms of that thing? Yeah. And I don't, I don't think so. Cause I think we're, we're getting that cyanide of potent there that we kind of can't get away from. Um, okay. But, but well, you're a good parameter. So there is a nice Morita equivalence at least between the spherical Daha and the full Daha there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. my, my answer in the chat was just that something almost close to that is true. There's a map. You have this, this dist of V tensor N. And just like in usual search of duality, there's a map from you know this symmetric group of the Heck algebra to the endomorphisms of V tensor N. So here it's the same thing. You have a map from the Daha to endomorphisms of dist of V tensor N. But, um, that map I mean, is, is not isomorphism. N means you tensor basically with V tensor N. Um, oh. Right. I mean, th th this, uh, if you like, this to V tensor N is the object that represents the functor FN. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yes. And then let's see, Oscar has something. All uh, right, so can you say something about the BC case? Um, so there's some natural things you could put in there. Um, I don't know if anyone like actually wrote something about Hata Kashiwara, like for the rational degeneration even. So there you have some sort of candidate endomorphism algebras. And I was just wondering, uh, since I think those involve like Heck algebras, the roots of unity, things like that. Uh, so if you have in this quantum case any expectation of what you could get. Uh, so I haven't thought about that at all. As you know, my, my student UA is working on um, just putting in, you know, basically the analog of, of, you know, functions on G mod K into it where, you know, GLP plus Q mod GLP cross GLQ in that setting. Um, yeah. And working on the, the, you know, the BC Daha mod we get out of that. Um, and so, but yeah, so the idea of having something like a Hadakashiwara D module there and what the definition would be, I haven't, I myself haven't thought about, and I haven't looked if in the classical world, if anyone has already done that I, and said. Levizer and Stafford also have some work on, Ooh. don't they? I Levizer think Levizer and Stafford also have studied some of these cases. I mean, but not quite from this point of view, but. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Chen Will and Shu have um, their own stuff, which doesn't involve uh, but that's, these, that's these models, but it should have an interpretation. And I think Saucy and Chen was thinking about this stuff uh, a while back, at least. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about it. If, um, if you want to, um, oh, good. Uh, yeah, I can, you know, my, my slide of attribution, I can like add them in. Um, yeah, like, we can talk about the symmetric space stuff at some other time. But yeah, I have to say, I, I, I haven't spent much time thinking about the symmetric space side, yeah. but I would like mm -hmm. to. I think okay. there's um, some interesting, interesting work to, to do there. Cool. Okay. Can I ask a question which is somehow opposite to your talk? Uh, uh oh. Namely, asking sure. whether you can get some new results for the Daha from this D module picture. I mean, you, you, you were going somehow in the opposite direction, roughly, but... Yeah, can you, we were going in yeah. ins Or can you get some new insight using this D-modules picture? Um, well, here's a small thing. I mean, so the way that it went, you know, we put K equals one, in other words, um, you know, V tensor itself N times and V was N-dimensional. Um, but of course, you can apply the functor putting many, many more Vs than that and sort of saying what you get. And, you know, once we know that we're putting in a semi-simple D module, then we know the output will also be semi-simple. 
And so, you know, on the one, you know, you can say, okay, it's a module of this form for the Daha, and it might have been really hard to show directly what its decomposition looked like. But this basically tells you as you keep increasing the number of tensor copies, it's still going to decompose in the same way. Um, so that's something you can learn about those specific representations. Um, in terms of learning something about the Daha from this, um, you know, other than that, I would say, you know, to me, the DQG site is more of a black box. So I personally probably won't learn something from working there, but I think, you know, Sam and David have a better handle on that world. And I think also maybe also the connections, you know, I started talking a little bit about factorization homology in the, the world of skein modules. So I could imagine that, you know, I could maybe imagine that the way it would work is knowing that that's equivalent to strongly equivariant D modules and then going to the, through the Daha through that. I could imagine learning, learning something um, about the Daha there. And again, that was a sort of connection, you know, more getting into TQFTs and, um, and, and manifold invariants that it gives you a way, um, made better access of using the Daha in that way. Um, but so far it hasn't, it hasn't taught me anything new about the Daha other than, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have looked at this, rep, this induced representation. The first time I looked at it, I was convinced it didn't split. I actually remember we told Sam, we're like, this is so weird for SL2, it doesn't split. He was like, oh, it, it, it should, it should be semi-simple. And I just kind of missed it. I wasn't expecting it because for the affine hack algebra, it didn't split. And somehow when you upgrade it to the double affine, it did. So that was a little bit of local bit of information I learned about the Daha. Um, but um, I think it'd be beautiful if, if, if um, this taught us something interesting about the Daha. Can okay. Ask, uh, Roman, do you have another question? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a general question. So, um, well, D modules and I believe quantum D modules, they form a monoidal category under convolution. So does your result say anything about this aspect? Um, so, I, I'm not sure it should, but just to me. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, monoidal, and, yeah. yeah. If you work with conjugation equivariant, then probably also tensor. Yeah. So uh, I can say that there is a monoidal structure, a braided monoidal structure on the strongly equivariant category, but I, I don't think these functors, these sort of springer type functors, will have any good relation with it. Okay. Just like parabolic restriction in, in, in general, you, shouldn't, you wouldn't expect to be monoidal. Thanks. But it's an interesting question of, yeah, huh. Okay, well, maybe let's thank Monica again. Uh